let's remember too to pray for our police officers. They are really, really under fire. And uh, I don't know, maybe you have done this. Uh, you're at a restaurant and you see a police officer buying lunch. Um, they'll say thank you and you can say thank you back to them. Amen. But remember, really remember to pray. And uh, we all need prayer. Amen. If you have a Bible, turn to the Psalms, Psalm 32. Psalm 32. When we're in trouble, we ask God for help. And uh, that's a blessing that we do that because that shows that we trust Him. Uh, his strength is made perfect in our weakness. All the fitness He requires is for you to fill your need of Him. And He delights in mercy. He delights in helping us. He's called in the Bible our refuge and our strength. Our high tower, we run into him and we're safe. We hide in him. And the verses are endless. I, I love the Psalms. I flee there <laughs> whenever I'm in trouble. So I'm there a lot. Amen. And uh, God is so good to, to help and guide and minister when we do that. There's no substitute for the word of God. Absolutely not. And let's read verse 7. This is Psalm 32. In verse 7, and the Bible says, Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. See that? Songs of deliverance. Let's ask God to bless his word today. Father, what a blessing it is to know you. And I pray today we would hear your voice. I pray we would see, understand, be enlightened all the different terms that you use to help us. Lord, without you, we can do nothing, but with you, we can do all things. And I pray you minister to us now and bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Songs of Deliverance. Uh, in Psalm 33, if you look down, look at verse 3, sing unto him a new song. And the psalms are songs, and they are full of praise to God. When you sing these psalms or these songs, you're, you're, you're just praising the Lord. Exodus 15, we read about Moses' song in the Bible. They just crossed the Red Sea. They've been delivered from the bondage in Egypt. And what a blessing it was. And so they started to sing. And, and you ought to read that song. It, the verses are great. It's in Exodus 15. Judges chapter 5, you have Deborah's song. And the enemy is defeated. And God has been the victor. And so there's a song. Acts chapter 16, very familiar with this one. Uh, Paul and Silas, it's at midnight. They are in prison. They have been beaten. They're going to be put to death in the morning. So they believed. And they sang. What did they sing? Let me see. What did they sing? Uh, working in a car wash? No. <laughs> that uh, I forget what it was. Oh, no. It was praises. They sang praises unto God at midnight, the darkest hour of the night. You have Revelation chapter 15. It says the song of the Lamb. That's also in chapter 5. It's throughout the book of Revelation. They're singing because they've been redeemed. And that is permanent. Amen? One day we'll be with the Lord and we'll sing those songs of deliverance. In 2 Corinthians 1.10, the Bible says, Who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we will trust, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. He delivered, he doth deliver, and he will yet deliver us. Because he's the deliverer. Amen? And we, we, we so enjoy that. Many times, you probably experience this, you're delivered in the problem, in the trouble, rather than from the problem or from the trouble. And so God is there to meet that need. A lot of Bible examples about that. If you still have your Bible open, look back to Psalm 32 and verse 9. I'm sorry, verse 8. Uh, verse 7 says, He's our hiding place, songs of deliverance. Verse 8, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. What a privilege that is. He will instruct us. He will teach us and he will guide us. That takes real humility to follow that. Amen? When we recognize that God knows more than us, 
Amen, duh. <laughs> you know, his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and that's a blessing, because we don't have to understand, we just open our hearts and our minds to him, and he teaches us. How does he do that? Through his word, through his spirit, amen, through his instruments. But God is always guiding and leading. Um, this is the way, walk ye in it. Uh, hear, you'll hear a voice behind you saying that. That's the voice of the Lord, and that's certainly a blessing. So what do we hear? It's the last day, 2 Timothy chapter 3. In the last days, perilous times shall come, men shall be lovers of themselves, more than lovers of God, proud boasters, you know, disobedient to parents. I mean, the list is endless. And it says there in that text about the last days, in verse 7, they resist the truth. And what is the truth? That is the word of the Lord. In chapter 4, the very next chapter in 2 Timothy, it says they turn away their ears from the truth. They resist the truth. They turn away their ears from the truth. The very next chapter in the Bible is Titus chapter 1. And in verse 14, it says they turn from the truth. You see a progression. Once you get on that road, it, it's like back in the Garden of Eden. Once the word of God is questioned, and there's not that humility to just believe what God said, then we kind of take our own direction and we resist the truth or turn from the truth. So, what do you hear? Do you hear God today? I hope, you know, in, in Revelation, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith. I'm gonna do my best as far as giving the word of God out, but God has to speak through that. You know, there has to be that being tuned in to it so God can meet a particular need. Jesus said in the Bible, it's not that you cannot hear, it's that you will not hear. And so if we're willing, God will certainly speak to us today. What do we see? We talk about the ear gate, which that's what people call it, the ear gate, because it reaches the heart. So we hear something and it affects our heart. But the eye gate affects our heart too. Um, it says, mine eye affecteth my heart. The Old Testament prophets were called seers because they saw something. They saw what God was doing. Think of all the distractions. Before we get into the message today, you know, we're so distracted in the world today with what? This virus. It has taken over the news. Absolutely taken over. And every day there's something a little bit different. And so we tune in. Well, maybe we don't tune in every day. You take a break from that. But I mean, and then you get this opinion and that opinion. And, and well, this has changed and that has changed. And now you have to do this. And boy, worry about this. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. And think of the distraction. Here's God, a good God who saved us, loves us, blesses us every day, and loads us with benefits. All of the blessings we have of God it's absolutely amazing, but to be consumed with this virus, you know? We ought to be singing praises at midnight that we know God and we know how this whole thing is going to end. Uh, the riots. Okay, I've seen some of that on TV. And as I watch it, you've got to be careful here because one of the main things the devil wants to do is destroy your spirit. And here you are, you're watching this. Oh boy, I wish I was... You know, and I wish I could, you know, and you get all these, and there's this, this angst, this anger that wells up, and be careful that it doesn't turn to malice or wrath, you know, it's sure there's an indignation about it, and as our brother said, we need to pray for our police officers, and we do, it's absolutely amazing, but sometimes it takes our spirit, it takes our emotion. And rather than praising the Lord, we're so angry. And that anger can absolutely consume us. We think about the election coming up. And uh, whatever side of the fence you're on, these are, these are really powerful. Uh, it's a powerful thing that's going to happen. And our future is going to be determined by, by that election. And so we spend our time, and I'm not saying we shouldn't be concerned about all of these things, but sometimes they are distractions. I am a Bible preacher. I am not a politician. I am not a doctor. I don't know about this virus. I don't know, you know, all the politics involved. All I know is what the Bible says about it. 
and I go back to the scriptures and I see some of these things are just precursors for the Lord coming back. I mean, you can see that. We understand it. God speaks to us. These things must come to pass. Amen? And so, oh, I wish it would happen to somebody. What's happening to us? Amen? And I know what God says and how God says to respond to it. And I'm trying to do that. Sometimes it's difficult because you want to respond how you think. But we have to go back to the scriptures. It's so important to see God in this. Um, Elijah was in a city called Dothan and his servant uh, saw the enemy surround that city. You know the story. And uh, boy, he said, alas, master, we perish. What should we do? I mean, look at the enemy. And Elijah said, Lord, open his eyes. And then God opened his eyes and that servant of Elijah the prophet saw the host of the Lord. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen? But sometimes we only see the problem. Uh, there's so many stories about this. Uh, last night, I think it was last night, there was a, a show on. You had to get it through the uh, internet or your email or whatever. But it was about Warren Brand. Uh, and he was the martyr. Well, actually, he wasn't put to death in Romania. But he, he was a Christian in Romania when the um, communists took over. And they put him in prison and they beat him. And finally he came back to America. He wrote a book, Tortured for Christ. Get it, it's a powerful book. And, uh, but he came back to America, I think he even testified before Congress about it. But his life was an absolutely amazing life, how they tortured him. And I believe, I didn't watch the whole thing, but I believe I've seen parts of it before where he won to Christ the jailer that had beat him. And I mean, they were very, very cruel. And he won him to the Lord. Apostle Paul, who was beaten in jail, and he thought he was going to die, he was put into the inner prison. Their hands and feet were in stocks. Many stripes were laid on them. Paul won that jailer to the Lord. That's Acts chapter 16. I wonder, would we be so distracted and so angry at those that mistreat us that we would lose our testimony before them. It's a real danger in a time like this. Or we would be like Christ would want us to be. And I'm not, you understand what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about rolling over or just, you know, not dealing with anything. But could we win our jailers? Could we win those that oppose us? Pray for those that despitefully use you. Love your enemies. I mean, those, those are verses in the Bible. Amen? And we certainly ought to be able to see that. I think that's important. The king's hand, heart, is in the hand of the Lord. He, as rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Some things must happen. What do we feel today? Do we feel fear? Do we feel anger? Do we feel hopelessness? What, what do we feel? What does God want us to feel? He wants us to feel hope. Because hope deferred making the heart sick. So what is our hope in? If our hope is in this, that's a downhill slide. But if our hope is in God, and God might use some of this for his glory. I, I mentioned this mail ad in the gospel. We probably wouldn't be doing that right now. Or being on the internet with our sermons and our devotionals. Maybe if this had to happen, we wouldn't have gone so much in that direction. But the gospel is going everywhere because of it. Amen? And sometimes the trial opens the door for God to work in somebody's life. Love, trust, conviction, repentance, uh, comfort, all of those things that God wants us to feel, not those emotions that would take us away from Him. We are to be doers of the Word and not hearers only. There are some things that we just cannot do on our own. We are helpless without the Lord. Do we recognize that? We can't do it without God. So the Bible says, God says that he is in us, and it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So God is at work. There's another verse that says, he which hath begun a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So God is at work. 
Amen? And as he works, we submit to that. As he instructs, we learn. As he teaches, as he guides, we follow. Victory. Amen? Not that our circumstances might change, but our hearts would. And that's what's important right now. The three Hebrew children were in the fiery furnace because they wouldn't bow. And you say, well, yeah, I'm not going to bow. If they want me to wear a mask to go into that store, I'll break the door down. I'll throw a rock through the window. Well, that'd be a great testimony, wouldn't it? You know? And maybe you'd have tied to the rock, God loves you. <laughs> no, I don't know. Uh, in Ephesians 1.18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Who does that? God does that for us. God opened Lydia's heart in the book of Acts. God opened the understanding of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. God did that. God enlightens us. He's the light of the world. Amen? And he opens our eyes. It says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Boy, that's such a blessing. James 1.5. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. Amen? If you lack wisdom, you ask God, because God wants to direct us. Well, what did Bob Jones Sr. say? He said some good things. Amen? He said a lot of good things. He said, wisdom is knowing how to use knowledge to successfully meet the emergencies of life. That's what wisdom is, knowing how to apply knowledge. So God teaches. He gives us his word. Wisdom knows how to apply that. Proverbs 17, verse 16. Wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he hath no heart to it? You have to have a heart for it, and then God certainly does the work. Uh, he will show you some amazing things if you just have a heart for God. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. It is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But the Spirit hath revealed them unto us. Amen. It goes on in that chapter, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, they are foolishness unto him. But unto us which believe, it's the power of God, it's the wisdom of God. What a blessing that is. And so because we believe, we absorb that. This, this is true. This is false. Click. Uh, wait till the next night. Same person might say a different thing. Amen? I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy making. But this will always say the same thing. Always. And it gives us a path. It gives us a direction. 1 John 2.20 It says, But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. So God, through His Spirit, makes the Word of God come alive. That's just such a blessing. I've got all these verses I want to quote, and uh, only two hours to do it in, amen? But uh, the Bible is so powerful. And when I quote these verses, and if you go back and listen to any of my sermons, listen, if there's 50, 100 verses, why do I do that? Because I don't like to study. I just quote the Bible, amen? But uh, I mean, the Bible is so powerful. You have in the scriptures, Philippians 4.11, not that I speak in respect of one, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Let me give you a lesson on how to be content. Amen? I'll give you the lesson and then everybody will go out and will be content. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Right? Content. Uh, Hebrews 13.5, let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. For he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So there's a lot in the Bible about content. Let me, let me teach you how to be content. I can't do that. God has to do that. Paul said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. God does it. God will do more than anything you hear, see. Amen. It's just his word. Uh, that doesn't mean... We do away with preaching because God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. 
And so we preach the word and we teach the word. But God has to enlighten us to that. Amen. You ever go home from church? Boy, that really spoke to my heart. You ever go home from church and that happened? You say, no, it never happened to me. <laughs> well, I hope it happens. I hope something happens. Where we can say, God spoke to me. God gave me his word. God's changing my life. God's leading me. God's directing me. Psalm 143.10, teach me to do thy will. Lead me into the land of uprightness. Ephesians 6.6, 6, doing the will of God from the heart. Titus 2.11, the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So if we've learned something from the grace of God, we live this way. We're a doer of the word. We're practicing that in our life. Um, train up a child the way you should go. I, I did uh, talk about the prodigal son last week in the sermon. And his father taught him, put the word of God in him. But, and when he was in the far country, he came to himself. The teaching and the word that he hid in his heart finally came to fruition. Here he was in a far country, really living a terrible life. But he came to himself. He says, I'm going to go home and I'm going to say, I've sinned against heaven and against you. And you know the story there. But he had to come to himself. That father of the prodigal is a picture of God. He teaches us. His word will not return void. Amen. Put as much in there as you can because that's the blessing. That's how God helps us. In 2 Kings chapter 6, there was a famine in the land. And I won't describe all the details, but uh, very invaluable things were a lot of money because people were starving. There were people that were... Uh, after their children died, they would eat their children. It was just a terrible, terrible famine in that land. And these two ladies came to the king and were begging for help. And the king said, if the Lord do not help thee, how shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor, out of the wine press, in other words, it's dry. It is empty. There is nothing left. If God doesn't help you, I can't help you. I have no resources. In Amos chapter 8, there's a story about another famine. It's not a famine of food and water. It's a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. Remember 2 Timothy chapter 4? Remember Titus chapter 1? They resist the truth. They turn their ears from the truth. And they turn from the truth. Because they said, we're not going to listen to that. Tickle our ears. We'll listen to that. But we're not going to listen to the truth. And there's a famine of that. But the place to get help is the Lord. He's the one that can open our heart to those truths. Uh, how do you really learn these things? You learn it by spending time with the Lord because they're spiritual truths. I, I love these promises in the Bible. Call unto me and I'll answer thee. Show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. So call, how do you call unto the Lord? That's prayer. And then we receive his instruction. He answers back. Amen? I've mentioned this before, but my mom, she got saved later in life. And uh, she would take the Bible and she'd just open it. And she'd go like that. I don't know if that's a real good way to study the Bible, you know. But she came up with some great verses sometimes. That was a real blessing where she put her finger right on a verse, you know. But she would pray. And then maybe that's how God answered her. I don't know. The least she is in her Bible. Amen. I can't wait to see her one day. She's with the Lord. Call on me. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Turn with me to Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. And we will look at a few verses there. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And let's read a number of verses here. Let's begin in verse 17. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, 
being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. These are unbelievers, and we're not supposed to walk like they walk or do what they do. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, because God taught us something. It says, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. We hear the truth. We're taught. Every time we hear the Bible, we're learning, we're being led, we're being guided. That you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry, and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from me with all malice in the greatest verse. And be ye kind one to another, for tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Those are powerful words. If we can apply them, Boy, that be a real blessing. Real blessing. The Lord will really use that. As touching brotherly love, this is 1 Thessalonians 4 and 9, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. He's the one that teaches that. Amen. He that is of God heareth God's words. So here we are. Okay, God, I want to be led. I want to hear. I want to follow. And he does give us his word. A.W. Tozer, I don't know if you've ever read anything by him, but he said, as we begin to focus upon God, the things of the Spirit will take shape before our eyes. We focus on God. Don't be distracted. What is God trying to do in this? You know, lift up your eyes. Uh, J. Oswald Sanders says, eyes that look are common, eyes that see are rare. When the Queen of Sheba, she heard about Solomon's glory, she said, I got to go see that. And when she did see it for herself, she said, the half has not been told. And when you really see those things, Job, I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I repent, changed his life. Isaiah, you go through until you get to chapter 6, and he's saying, woe unto them, woe unto them, woe unto them. He gets to chapter 6, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Woe unto me. Woe is me. And when we see the Lord, it's humbling. And, well, maybe my way isn't right. What does God want? And you find out the way God wants. And then you can be used. Oswald Chambers said, The insight that relates us to God arises from purity of heart, not of clearness of intellect. It's not what we know. It's who we know, and it's our heart that's connected with that. The, again, the verses are endless. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I am meek and lowly of heart. You'll find rest. If any man will do his will, he shall know. If you will, you're willing to do his will. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Uh, God teaches us how to love, be merciful, be kind, be long-suffering, be holy. He teaches us all of that. Search me, O oh God, know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me. That's what he says and lead me in the way of righteousness. That principle comes up over and over and over and over. Psalm 23, um, the Lord, he leads us beside the still waters. I mean, he just guides. Praise the Lord for that. Some things only God can teach us. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The whole Bible is like that. I mentioned uh, in the devotional for today a plaque that I have in my office. And uh, I, I, 
some years ago, I wanted to go back and see the preachers that were involved in my salvation. And because uh, I'm a preacher and I wanted to see, I know who the preacher was that I got saved under, and I knew who the preacher was that he got saved under, but I didn't know going back so far. So I got online and I went back as far as I could. And uh, one of the preachers in the line of my salvation was Gypsy Smith. Gypsy Smith got saved after hearing another guy, and, and I, I put him on that plaque too, but I have that in my office. But anyway, Gypsy Smith, he was a gypsy. He never attended one day of school. Not one day of school. And he was just a boy, and he heard this preacher preach, and he said, I've got to be saved. And he talks about his conversion. And then he got with General William Booth of the Salvation Army. And, and then from there he became, he just was a great preacher. And then there was a preacher that got saved under him. And a preacher that got saved under him. Listening, and the preacher got saved under him. And then there was me. And I, I, there was a preacher that's, well, there's some preachers that are out in the ministry, but I made a plaque for one of the preachers that was saved under my preaching, and I put his name in there and just added it. And you know, maybe he's adding some too. But what a heritage. And here's a man that never went to school a day in his life, and yet God mightily used him. Amen. Isn't that a blessing? It's not what we know, it's who we know. In Matthew 13, there are four different types of ground. And God says it's a parable. And the sower went forth to sow, and he sowed the seed. And the seed is the word of God. Four different types of ground. But one was good ground. That's speaking of a good heart. And so here goes the seed. It's going out. Amen. And as it goes out, if it finds good ground, it produces a lot of fruit. Praise him at midnight. Praise him at midnight. Praise him when it's dark. This, uh, this virus has really distracted a lot of people. Distracted. Certainly a lot of Christians too. Uh, there's so many different views on what is going on. You know, some people say six feet apart. Some people say ten feet apart. Some people say two miles. You know. Uh, it's okay to meet outside, but not in the church. It's all right to do this. It's, you, you have to wear a mask to be safe. Uh, wearing a mask is the worst thing you'll do. You know? I mean, it's absolutely crazy. I don't know how you, how you bring all of that together. As a pastor of a church, I'm trying to put it all together. And uh, there's different ideas. Amen? All different kinds of ideas. You believe what you believe? They believe what they believe. Everybody believes what they believe. And that could change tonight. Amen? And we're not talking about something like a circumstance. We're talking about what does God want us to do in a dark time. I think he wants us to praise him. You ever, uh, and I'm like this, if, if I don't eat, I start to get weak. Uh, I eat a good breakfast. Uh, Linda makes me sausage, home fries. Um, pancakes along with the biscuits and gravy and you know some corn muffins and and, uh, and the bacon and the bacon and I usually eat about three eggs with that you know what a blessing no I I'll eat some for breakfast and right around lunchtime or maybe a little past that I'll start to get a little weak and I know I need to eat again that happened to anybody you know unless you drink a lot of coffee, then you don't need to eat at all. You just fly around, amen? You know, this is the bread of life. It really is. And we really need to stay in this. Because through this, God can comfort us. And I'll, I'll close with this. And again, Paul said that in then one three more chapters. But, uh, the Holy Spirit is the comforter. What do you think a comforter does? I hmm. wonder why they called him a comforter. Uh, let's see, the comforter, he probably stirs everything up, right? 
No, he, he's a comforter. Amen? So he comforts us. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Praise the Lord. We can be comforted in all our tribulation, and then we can comfort somebody else by the comfort word that we ourselves are comforted with God. Spend time in this. These are words of comfort. Amen? And we'll get through this, and it could get worse. It could get better. Well, I know what I'm praying, but we have no control over that. The only thing we can do is honor the Lord through it. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for your word today. I pray, Lord, today that you bless your people, bless all that hear this message. May we sing praises at midnight. May we not be distracted. May we, may we follow on to know you. May you be glorified in what we do, our spirits, our responses, because you're worthy. Bless the word now in Jesus' name.